So probably not coincidentally, these presentations fit quite well to each other. <laughs> uh, we've heard about mobility and circularity within that, and now we've heard about waste management and um, stakeholder engagement, and now we come very much to um, the resource inputs into the city system, and with a specific focus on the built environment, but also what the built environment does to the whole dynamic um, in the city. And um, that is very much in the spirit, I think, what um, Susanne introduced in terms of making multiple times the function, the societal well-being or the joy, <laughs> I like that one, Freude, um, out of a given volume or, or gram of uh, natural resources. And we focus specifically on those resources that are really emissions intensive, pollution intensive and just really hard to abate very technical term, but basically to decarbonize any other way than just being really efficient with them. And coming to this perspective, I'd like to start with, well, it's a personal opinion, but it's based on data. Cities are really great, right? They're really amazing places. Um, they are resource efficient almost by definition. Yes, they emit 70% or something like that of emissions in the world, but that's simply because most people live there, right? So um, that's just where, where we are. But compared with any other settlement structure, cities and the classic something like Munich Center is by definition, um, or, or currently it's the most efficient settlement structure that we have. And it's not only efficient, it's also great. I mean, I'm not from Munich, but I really enjoy coming here. I'm in London, it's a hate-love uh, relationship, but um, you know, it's also a great city. And um, we made a little diagram, right, when cities are designed nicely and well, um, they really provide us, well, basically our lives, right? They're places for social interaction, innovation, everything we talk about, and really the, the backbone of especially Europe's well-being and prosperity, right? I mean, if you think about Europe, you think about great cities and their diversity and their vibrancy and, and all of that. Um, so I think that is really much the, the mindset that we approach it in, in systemic, and I think we are here too, right? It's how making them even better for even more people in a fairer way and really make them even more resource efficient. So we made this, I do want to underline, um, there are many different shapes in which a city can be great and resource efficient. <laughs> this is something I must admit that um, I quite like. <laughs> so I made this and um, I also will be transparent that I saw some plans here from Munich from something called Bayern Kaserne, now it has a new, has a new name. Um, and I think that looks really nice. I mean, it's not built yet, but we kind of use that as an inspiration of, of what a really good urban life looks like. Um, and also it's important to say, I have some examples later, that this is not imagination, right? Europe looks like this in many places and people are really, you know, usually quite happy in these places. Um, I'm talking about Europe now because we work a lot with the European Commission and so on and we heard about before this is a great agenda for Europe kind of to take leadership in. I do think lots of this is applicable to other places and by all means it's not, you know, meant to be exclusive. Um, unfortunately, not that many places <laughs> yet look like what I've just shown um, in Europe. There are lots of pilots and neighborhoods that are great, but a lot of Europe and even more of the world still looks more or less like this. It's not a final graphic either, you might notice, um, but um, you know, a lot of settlement structures are, are still quite inefficient and also imbalanced, right? It's not just about efficiency, it's about getting that balance with nature space and so on. And um, we kind of saw in that you know, efficiency, we're at the moment not talking about circularity, although I think there are lots of overlaps. It's really about seeing you know, the overall resource input that goes into a city, um, but a lot of this will have lots of interactions with other sort of circular levels, right? Um, so yeah, this is not our analysis. This is a synthesis of great analysis that is there in Europe, but really hasn't been brought together like this before. At least I, I haven't seen it, and a lot of latest IPCC research. Um, and again, we can see that you know a lot of sort of semi-rural suburban life is not greatly organized. Um, there are land inefficiencies that then usually lead to a lot of excess. I call it excess <laughs> um, infrastructure because it's not really serving people's um, well-being. 
Um, and then also kind of counterintuitively, it's what I think many people think is a sort of greener life with maybe the single family home and their garden, maybe for them, but of course for the overall population that just puts nature even further away. Um, and also, um, you know, there are some studies that actually suburbs and, and valley positions have more noise because of the overall traffic increase than is if they were living in like a calmer neighborhood within the city center. So I think there are a lot of misconceptions also about what, you know, a good life provides and so on. So um, uh, moving on, so what are we actually seeing in Europe, right? Where, where are we between these <laughs> both uh, pictures? And what does that mean for our, our resource consumption? Um, it's, as always, you know, not a simple picture. Um, you can tell that the land efficiency um, of um, urban settlements in Europe is slightly marginally improving, <laughs> but it hasn't really like, made a big improvement over 50 years. You can see that if you look at the World Cities report and so on. Um, and while we're slightly improving overall, a lot of the very inefficient trends are increasing too. And that, to me, implies inequality is rising effectively, right? I live in central London on something like 40 square meters. <laughs> you know, I do not suggest that you make that even more efficient. <laughs> but there are places that are, you know, really using a lot of space and have underused rooms and so on. Um, and currently, really, we see the trend that where it's already efficient, it gets even denser. And then the rest is a bit more of a, of a mixed picture. Um, a few other trends, right? As for example, 35%, you can say they live in underoccupied dwellings. That means that rooms are just not being used and using energy and are just there and not being used. I'm not saying any of this is easy to solve, right? Probably no one built a house and said, let's build three rooms we're not using, right? It's like kids were in there before and then they move out and then what do you do with your house? So, you know, any, any of this is a, is, is a big transition. But nevertheless, I don't think that should <laughs> mean we're, we, you know, we just discarded. But unfortunately, that's a bit what's happening now. So I read a lot of climate reports and climate strategies and probably read every Green Deal strategy. This is not there, right? It's just overlooked. Um, and it's OK to say it's complex, but it's not OK to just leave it out. And I think this is the discussion, really, that we want to start with the white paper, also with the circular community, I call it. How do we bring this together, right? Um, how can we bring that in and make it, make it fruitful? Um, what we also, so we just did a white paper about this, maybe I should have said, and at Systemic we really like numbers, so we did a big analysis on like where, how does it look where, and we made a lot of indicators of space utilization in terms of land use, space use within buildings, and so on, everything that we feel is not serving, you know, quite well now, um, society's well-being. And um, this is 15 profiles that we have mapped, and you can, you know, they're very small, so I'm not <laughs> expecting you to read them, and I don't have time to go through them, although, of course, I find them fascinating. Um, but you can see that, you know, a few of these profiles are very red. Uh, red is, you know, let's say there's a lot of potential to improve. Um, and actually, Munich is in the second profile. So it's, um, you know, it has quite promising trends, there are some problems. Um, we named this profile extensive urban rural expansion. <laughs> These terms might, you know, them, some, someone might come up with punchier terms. But basically what that means, you know, it has a great basis, there are great um, uh, pilots and so on in the city center. It's actually looking quite good from a physical point of view, right? Physical efficiency, I'm not talking about affordability necessarily. Um, however, the whole urban region Purely looking at the data, I'm not from Munich, um, there is um, a lot of inefficiencies that then calls, causes inefficiency in road building and public transport and so on. So whoever is here from Munich, I'd be fascinated to hear about you know, regional cooperation pilots or whatever is going on, on in that thinking. I will move on. Um, now, when we talked about this, what I heard a lot was to say, but Europe is built already. We've built our built environment, we can recycle a bit, but like, how can we change our urban form? Shouldn't we be looking at India and Africa? I said, for sure you should. <laughs> Probably not me, because I don't know anything about those places, but um, we are shaping and reshaping a lot in Europe. We have a lot of intra-Europe migration, and we're building a lot, and um, you know, there are many places with housing crises, which means there's demand to build more. So it's really the question about how do we shape that and it's not about shaping only the growth it's also shaping about um, also about shaping the shrinking right so it's not nice to admit that maybe you're in a place that will shrink and maybe never grow again 
um, but just uh, leaving spaces empty and unused will just accelerate the decay, right? So it's really that right-sizing, I'm thinking. So if we did all of that, right, or if we did nothing, <laughs> if we just build next year exactly the same as this year, um, we will emit 91 million tons just from built environment adding stock, right? If we instead did it in a way that, quite frankly, socially makes also most sense, we would save about half of those emissions. And by the way, that is the equivalent of France's entire manufacturing and construction emissions in a year. So it's quite a significant chunk. And that is also very hard to save in any other way because lots of these emissions is asphalt for road building, which is just, it's really hard to decarbonize. Um, yeah, really just a positive note, I know mentioned this, right? None of this is uh, coming uh, out of our theoretical heads. There are lots of examples where people live very happily um, with very good footprints. There's a lot of indicators here. I'm very happy to explain them at some other point. But um, yeah, there are places in Zurich and, and um, Freiburg and Barcelona, but also many other places that I had never heard of in Hungary and in in Grenoble and in the Netherlands and, you know, all over, and also also lots of them in Munich. Um, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay, and then, of course, the question is, how can we move from one <laughs> to the other reality? And it's interesting, I think, because a lot of these solutions that we found, and this was just a big case study analysis, um, there's a lot of overlap with probably what people usually would conceive as circular measures, right? So this is definitely a complementary agenda. Um, so it's very much about revitalizing city centers and hubs, basically places that are already compact to live in. We need to just really make them better. Um, and that's happening, right? It's all about just, it's about scaling. Um, there's the quality upgrading and um, upsizing. This one I found interesting of buildings, not happening so much yet, but often it's counterintuitive, right? When we talk about the space agenda, people, you know, get very nervous, especially where I live. Like, you want me to leave even smaller, <laughs> you know? I already don't know where to store my suitcase. And I'm like, absolutely not. Actually, in most really dense places, we would suggest to upsize apartments because that is what drives people out, right? If you just have the choice of 40 square meters or your single family home with three unused rooms, at some point you will choose the latter. Um, there is something about upfilling and infilling um, low density areas. Very importantly, that should not be just scattered around but into functional hubs, right? That can then uh, 15 minute city type hubs. Um, there's the adaptation of underoccupied building, right sizing the declining area is very important. Um, Upgrading, of course, the active and public transport links, just making something dense. I just you know, came back from Sicily, beautiful holiday. It's very dense, but there's no public transport, so then you know, the density doesn't have much you know, value <laughs> in, in a sense. Um, yeah, then, of course, it's all about the spaces for local businesses and culture. You know, I think we cannot overstate the importance of local art and culture and um, institutions to make these places vibrant. And necessarily, it's all about the balance, right? So if you really, if you didn't build all of these streets that I was talking about, you would save a lot of space. If you then distribute that space a little bit more equally across an urban area, you will gain a lot of green space, which is also kind of counterintuitive, right? Oh, compactness, we will lose our green space. It's not actually the opposite, right? You will gain space that you can distribute, which will save you something around two to six degrees of extreme summer temperatures in inner cities. So, and that's a European number. Um, and there's a lot more <laughs> on case studies and policy approaches, um, which you can read in the white paper, but that it is for now. <laughs>